Welcome to Chit Chat Money. On this show, hosts Ryan Henderson and Brett Schaefer interview industry experts and riff on the world of investing. As a quick reminder, Chit Chat Money is a CCM Media Group podcast. Anything discussed on Chit Chat Money by Ryan, Brett, or any other podcast guest is not formal advice or recommendation. Now, please enjoy this episode. Welcome in. This is the Tuesday episode on Chit Chat Money. Notice how I said, uh, or didn't say, not so deep dive episode, which is what our typical episodes are. I do not know what the title is for this one yet. We're mixing things up. For anyone that doesn't know, we shut down our investment fund. Ryan and I, Ryan, I should say, is on the call with me here too. We should call and it our, like our portfolio because it's like so, it's us now, yeah. you know. I like it's, that. It's I don't not Arch it, Capital, but. but it's like what we're doing with our own stocks or our own portfolio. Yeah. Personal updates, something like that. I think we can do that. I don't know about that for the title, but definitely yeah for the show. Ryan did. Uh, tease it there. We are going to be talking about stuff that we are thinking about buying, have researched maybe. And the format of these shows is going to be a little bit different. I think it's going to be quite fun where one person is going to try to do a research for a pitch, give some good data, kind of give a company overview. And then the other person is going to be a springboard to try to play a little devil's advocate, come up with some feedback, all the good stuff. And today I'm doing a pitch and it is on Altria Group a sin stock conglomerate. I'm going to go through it. Uh, Hopefully it can be insightful for any listeners. I should disclose I do not own shares today, Uh, but we'll get into whether I'm looking to buy some. That could could easily change. Yeah, we have all those disclosures. Can't change today because the market's closed, but it could change in a future date. (laughs) Yeah. So anything else you want to tell the listeners, Ryan, about this format? Am I missing anything before we get into the company overview? No, to be honest, I didn't have to do a whole lot of work for this episode. So Brett and I just are, we're going to be alternating basically either pitches, whether it's to buy something, sell something, some sort of change that's going on in our personal portfolios now. Uh, And so because Brett's basically pitching Altria. We're going to go through the business and we'll get to his conclusion in a little bit. I'm going to basically be asking questions and I'm going to let Brett kind of be, it's almost like we're doing a deep dive episode or an interview where you're the guest. Is that fair? Yes, somewhat, but I think a little bit more interactive. The interviews are more us just asking a question and letting them talk for five minutes. That's how we like to roll. But I will say, I do have some good charts in this episode, so subscribe to the newsletter for free. That link will be in the show notes wherever you're listening. And if you enjoy these shows, the best way to support is just five star on either Apple Podcast or Spotify. And then lastly, as we try to, we're still figuring out the format here, but since in our personal accounts, we only own about 10 stocks each, these are not going to be companies that we're always just super excited to own. It's almost like, and I know this is going to happen a lot of the times, we're interested in this company, but either there's one little flaw or a couple little flaws that we're looking to you know, get answered, or the price is probably too high. So we're going to discuss that today with Altria Group. Let me get right into it. They are a Sinstock conglomerate focused on the tobacco and nicotine space. They have a long history uh, which we'll go into into the next section for anything that's relevant for the investment today. And Altria has really no meaning. It's just a consultant word. I got to say, quite a good one. We just covered Diageo last week. I think that's another just made up term. And Altria is quite good because no one actually knows what they do. But I should say their largest segment, people are going to know, and it is Philip Morris USA, and it is dominated by the Marlboro brand. Uh, they sell cigarettes only in the United States. And we'll get into the history of why that is because they split up from their international group. And then in uh, within their smokable segment, which I should say is their largest one, they have the black and mild cigar brand, which some people might know of. So they have, it's a smaller part of smokables, but still, you know, could have some impact on the business. It's a solid, solid size one. But the most important part of this business by far is... Philip Morris USA, and within Philip Morris USA, it is the Marlboro brand. Now, they have three other segments that I decided to kind of throw out here that I think are important for context. The second one is oral tobacco. 
Now, this includes three important brands, one, Copenhagen, two, Skull, and three, the On. I don't know if you're supposed to yell because it has the exclamation point, the On <laughs> nicotine bath of, brand. But it's kind of a bad name, if I'm being honest. It's it's bad, yeah. Hard to like well, write. It's hard to write about because it's like not. It's got an exclamation mark, but it's not the end of the sentence. Uh, it's just oh like, yeah, the the autocorrect things just do not like that. And I gotta say, we, we will talk later about how I'm a little nervous about this this brand, although it has done you know fairly well. So there's those big three for anyone that's in the kind of uses any oral tobacco products. You will know that Copenhagen and Skull dominate the market. Uh, Altria has historically dominated the oral tobacco market in the United States with over 50 percent market share. However, and this is an important note for the listeners and the investors. In recent years, that has fallen due to the proliferation of the new Zin nicotine pouch brand, which is now owned by Altria's past subsidiary, Philip Morris International. Altria's market share is down to 44% for this category, and it's been ticking downwards for the last five years. Third segment, I will call vaping, which is maybe like a smoking-esque or Anything within that category, you know, you could talk about their heat, not burn stuff too here. They spent around $3 billion acquiring Enjoy, which is N-J-O-Y. That is a vaping product. Uh, It's their new foray here. They had previously purchased a $12.8 billion stake in Jewel uh, that has now been written down to zero uh, with, uh, it was a big mistake. We should, we'll talk about that maybe in a little bit. Ryan. Maybe I can, as I try to take a breath here, add you in here. The vaping category, I kind of have an assumption of writing it to zero and honestly having negative value for this business because of their blunders. What are your, I mean, it was Jewel, it's one of the worst investments this century, right? By far, given the size. Yeah, I think, well, it's really easy to say that now, but I do, I do want to say like, if you were Altria's management team three years ago and you were witnessing the rise of Jewel, because it was like it was really the only kind of popular vape nicotine product. And, and it went viral. Yeah. I mean, it had an insane market share in, in the uh the non dis like the not the disposables, but the like ones where you refill. I mean, it had like almost hundred percent market share. So it I could see where it was coming from, but when you make an investment of that size, I think you have to be very cognizant of the political risks, the risks of competition coming down the pipe and do your due diligence and check that they're advertising targeted stuff to people under the age of 18. And that's not going to fly in any sort of court with any sort of political administration uh, yeah. in there. Like if they did their due diligence, they would have seen that the company was acting badly but this is not a post-mortem about jewel anything else to add there right well i think we're going to talk about maybe some of their capital allocation issues over the last couple of uh well last decade here's my thing and i just want to get to it now the capital allocation has been bad but if you're the executives at altria you're looking at your smokables and you're thinking even though we could drive pricing power, maybe we can juice more out of this. We need to find some sort of a new long-term business uh, that has something. a growth category. Yeah. And unfortunately for them, most of their choices or most of their uh, ventures have flopped in kind of a big way. And it wasn't like they bet small and let it grow. You know, I mean, the jewel, they went like sh- shoulder deep into... Uh, <laughs> To a very bad investment. So it's, I mean, I, yeah, bad capital allocation, but I understand where they, well, I understand the thought process on getting behind some of these brands. Yeah. And I'll we'll get into the history. The on one, two was good. You know, so far they're kind of, I wouldn't say losing, but, you know, Zen is just much, much bigger. And as we get to the fourth category, so the first one, smokables, think cigarettes, and then black and mild cigars, second, oral tobacco. Think open egg and skull and the on nicotine pouches and smokables, I should say, is about, you know, I think, 90% still of revenue and higher part of operating income. So the key for profits is smokables. But the fourth part I have here is investments. And there's two, 
but one that matters. So they have a large stake in Kronos Group, which is a Canadian cannabis producer. Don't really care about that. Second one, they own 10% of Anheuser-Busch. We have these two stakes together, which the majority is Anheuser-Busch. Actually, let me get an update here because uh, I have a live tracker. The investments are worth about, yeah, $12.5 billion still. So the Anheuser-Busch stake is large. And if we look at their market cap, it's approximately $75 billion. And then if we add in their long-term debt of $25 billion and they have minimal uh, cash, their enterprise value comes out to around $85 billion. So a large portion is this Anheuser-Busch stake. Now, they can't do anything about it. Anheuser-Busch pays a little bit of a dividend to them. But it'll be interesting to see what they do. And we can kind of theorize. Maybe we can talk about it now. Should they sell this stake? Or what are your thoughts here, Ryan? Because I kind of go back and forth. The answer would probably be no. And so maybe I would have said yes, like two years ago, whatever, kind of just give the money back to shareholders. But now that we've seen some consistent years of steeper volume declines than the whole last decade prior, I'm I'm starting to get worried more so that they need to they need to find something that isn't in terminal decline and at least not increasingly in terminal decline. So like the the deceleration is or sorry, the decline is accelerating. Alcohol is one area where it's pretty resilient. Now beer has lost some market share to spirits over the last decade, but still it's it's growing on a total sales basis. So I don't know. Hold on to it would be my choice. At least it gives you some something that is growing in the portfolio. It's technically probably the biggest thing that's the biggest. Yeah, it's got to be the only the largest like growth driver for them. Even though it's like a minority investment, technically alcohol would be the biggest growth driver for them. Yeah, and black and mild. The cigars is. I think has been growing. Actually, should have looked at that, but it's been fairly stable. So that's a highlight here for kind of the smokable segments. I don't have that data in front of me, so maybe someone would argue that. But again, that's a, that's a pretty small portion of the business as well. I think okay. I, two two things. I think one, and I kind of agree with this a little bit, but I also see where Ryan's right is any tobacco investor would say, well, the business has been in terminal decline for fifty years. But volume declines have the rate has changed uh, over the last few years. And I think, uh, you know, the big question is, is is this an anomaly or the new normal here? Then second, I, one thing I'm worried about is one, the the prevalence of beer drinking going down and the new weight loss pills. Uh, there's a lot of data out there about how it stops people from drinking heavily and can help people cure their alcoholism and really the anheuser Bush's core customers are people that drink a lot of beer, right? And if those go away, I mean, that's that's pretty, you know, bad. But what can Altria do here? Maybe if their stock gets cheap enough, they sell it to buy back, right? That would make sense. But it's can a fine they, line between when is start, it cheap. Can they just start selling stock in the open market? Like I, I believe I that, uh, yeah, the contract or whatever the term has passed. But I, honestly, I should have looked at that. that I, I should have confirmed that. But yeah, I believe they can now. See, here's my problem. And if you're like, if you're listening to this podcast from the point of view of you're a tobacco investor and you've been, you are maybe hoping to get some confirmation bias out of the show potentially. I, you know, we've been there. We've been invested in the tobacco space. There's a lot of competitive advantages, but right now for Altria, you, they've basically got like if they li- if they sell their stake in Anheuser Busch to buy back stock, th- they're selling a declining business to buy back. Um, not n- now. Revenue growth actually has gotten to the point where it's negative, but the it's like you're buying a decliner to buy an even worse decliner in terms of volumes. I, I just, they got to find kind of a different pillar here. And my other part here is I think even the 
staunchest supporters of Altria as an investment would say that at the current volume declines, the math kind of breaks where they can't really keep up the earnings growth if they're getting those 8% potentially volume declines or greater. Well, I might have a, my number seven and a half percent, but I think that kind of blended that with the black mild. I, I don't know. I don't know, right? It might work. Well, Your revenues are declining later. now, right? Oh, well, I'm saying the earnings can grow because margins are going to keep going higher, but that's for another section. Good Shop Money is brought to you by Interactive Brokers. Designed for active traders and sophisticated investors, Interactive Brokers offers trading assets in 150 markets with 27 different currencies. Interactive Brokers also charges USD margin loan rates from 5.83% to 6.83%. They've also got the ability to trade stocks, bonds, futures, options, commodities, and more, all from a single unified platform. Brett and I use Interactive Brokers ourselves, and I honestly have to say that if you spend a considerable amount of time managing your investments, if you're spanning the globe looking for new stocks, I highly recommend using Interactive Brokers as your platform of choice. Restrictions apply, but for more information, visit IBKR.com, member SIPC, open an account with IBKR today. Uh, let's. As we get this intro section out of the way, I want to go through kind of the five things I th I'm thinking about for sort of whether I'd buy Altria, you know, what I'm looking at for this pitch is one, what will smokable revenue look like five years from now? What will the trajectory be over the next five years? Two, what will oral tobacco revenue look like five years from now? This is much less relevant, but still important. Generates about $1.6 billion in earnings for them. Three, Will management be smart capital allocators, or maybe also what will they? What are they going to do here? And then four, assign no value to anything else. So no value to vaping, nothing excluding basically Kronos Group, all that stuff. So I'm just strictly strictly talking oral tobacco and I'll cut you off there because uh, well, I want to butt in so you don't have to monologue the whole show. But is it okay to assign no value? Well, is I saw that, negative on my. I saw, say, I, or is that optimistic? Well, I'll go through the math, and I uh, put in a billion dollar handicap each year for management blunders over the next five. That's kind of right. still might be yeah. optimistic. <laughs> yeah, it could be if if the if the the people that are buying jewel are still there. But yeah, you know, <laughs> if that mistake happens again, well, there's a lot of value that's going to be destroyed, and. And so I'll talk about it. it wasn't even probably more value than 12.8 billion. I got destroyed because they got laden with debt. And the last one is basically going through some math and, you know, after all this stuff and trying to be a conservative, still the volume declines, going through all the math saying, what capacity will they have to pay the dividend and repurchase stock? So trying to do some math there because that with the yield at about nine and a half percent, or I think the stock's been up a little bit this week. So maybe closer to 9%. I mean, that's a big deal. That's it's, it's the most important part of the thesis here. So let's move on to the history. You, we could do a whole podcast on the history of Altria Group. That's for another show. But we're going to look at, you know, what are the important things for how the business got to where it is today. So Philip Morris is a long-standing cigarette brand or company. Started out over 100 years ago and has been running with this Marlboro brand for a long time. Any older listeners will know about the. Uh, Marlboro Man, the cowboy, all that good stuff when they could still advertise. Uh, and if we look at specifically what they've done from a business perspective, acquisitions and divestiture and the divestitures or is divest? I can never say that one correctly. In 2008, they spun off Philip Morris International, which is now under the ticker PM and focused specifically on the United States market. So it's all in the United States here. In 2007, they acquired John Middleton which is the cigars business. And then in 2016, Anheuser-Busch merged with Saab Miller. Altria Group maintained a 10% stake in this com combined conglomerate since then. So they, Anheuser-Busch, they've had a relationship with this company or parts of it for a long time, but in under the current form, it's been since 2016. Um, but then starting in about 2017, 2018, they went through... <laughs> I think it was probably the panic from the vaping growth, right? Because that's when it was really taking off. 
uh, they started making these investments. So in 2018, they take the sizable stake in Jewel Labs. 2019, they take an 80% stake in Helix Innovations, which is the nicotine pouch stuff, uh, the tobacco-free nicotine pouch stuff, I should say, and then eventually bought the whole business. And then also in 2019, they took a large stake in Kronos Group. Uh, in 2021, they sold their wine business, St. Michelle, St. Michelle Estates, for about $1.2 billion, I believe, in Fun 2022. Fact. Fun fact, Brett used to work there. Yep, not too far from our houses. Not too far. They had a good concert series. I used to work at. Uh, 2022, they announced a joint venture with Japan Tobacco to commercialize a tobacco heat stick product, which is another reduced risk product. TBD, what's going to come up with this? We don't know. Also in 2022, the company gave back the rights of the Heat Not Burn iCoast product uh, spelled I-Q-O-S, back to Philip Morris International for over $2 billion so Philip Morris International could sell the product in the United States. The change begins in 2024, so we'll see what the impact on the market is there and what Philip Morris International is going to do. And then in earlier in 2023, they completed the acquisition of Enjoy, the new vaping venture. So a lot of stuff has been moving around. I hope is not an investment thesis, but I would hope over the next five years, we see a lot less of this chaos, Ryan, but I don't know if that's something you should, that should be discounted, right? We, I think that's why I have the the management handicap there. Yeah, I don't mind the small stuff. I really don't. In fact, I, I'd probably encourage it. Like if you're going to buy small uh, whether it's vaping or oral tobacco or <clears throat> just sort of modern nicotine businesses, I think I'm okay with that because obviously Altria has the distribution. They've got the relationships with distributors and retailers that they can scale these concepts pretty quickly. So I'm fine with them paying up for the small ones. Yes, I would be seriously concerned if we started to see big plunges like what you saw with Chul and enjoy what I mean, a- frankly we, we don't know what's happened there but it's a big investment right it's not small yeah and if you're handicapping one billion if that enjoy goes to zero potentially the handicap wasn't enough if yeah on well, one billion, like each billion year. right yeah, yeah. i'm gonna do one billion each year so five billion total but they could do something else. The interesting point is what if they bought Swedish match for 16 billion? Now that would have actually worked out. And we, it's not it a show about Philip Morris. Inter- yeah. It's not a show about Philip Morris international, but what's interesting is that the total return for all true group has been higher than Philip Morris international. I think over the last 10 years, despite the narrative, uh, which I think is quite interesting. So Philip Morris international has made a lot of, you know, they talk a big narrative. They talk a lot of stuff about, the new age products, but if you look at their profitability, yeah, you know, some of it's foreign exchange, but Ultra Group has done quite well. But if you want to look at the history of the tobacco industry, there are really just a few important things to know. First, it's the key one. The usage rate of cigarettes in the United States has steadily declined over the past half century. However, in recent years, usage of the, quote, new age risk-reduced products such as vaping and nicotine pouches have been rising in popularity by a ton. So the volume of cigarettes has been declining at an accelerating rate, but nicotine usage has stabilized. Second, in 1998, the uh, what is called the Master Settlement Agreement, MSA, was signed by the four big tobacco companies, including Altria Group. This was a signed agreement that would pay the government and other stakeholders based on the harm tobacco products had on society. I have a quote for the newsletter. I'm not going to read it all, but there was uh, our friend Lawrence Hamtel from Twitter of Fortune Financial Advisors did a written interview with the author Gene Hoots, who covers the tobacco space. I think he worked in the tobacco industry for a long time. He basically said, there are all these stakeholders here that really, you know, the tobacco companies and the harm that cigarettes had and how they tried to underplay that, they had a lot at stake. And, you know, there's the FDA, government's attorneys, tobacco farmers, blah, blah, blah. Over a 50-year period, this MSA could reach $1.7 trillion in payments. I mean, he basically said, like, the a staggering sum like this would kill almost any industry. But when it happened in 1998, 
it's not so for tobacco because, you know, with a shrug, as he puts it, they were able to cover all these added costs by raising cigarette prices by only 45 cents a pack, even allowing them to increase their profit slightly. And then he goes further and says uh, they also benefit because the potential for lawsuits are gone now. They've had, you know, everyone's aware that cigarettes are bad for you. And now that they pay this gigantic sum, they have quote unquote paid their debts, I guess, to society. And then he follows it up here that Philip Morris had the best advantage because all cigarette promotion ceased at the time. And they had the largest market share with Marlboro. So almost since the master settlement agreement and since the freezing of advertising, market shares within cigarettes have been remarkably stable because it's really hard. I mean, who's making a new cigarette? So that they had the, the best advantage there. And that kind of leads into that is fun. it's uh, like funny. the uh, competitive advantage section. But yeah, you, you have a follow-up? It's kind of a funny thought experiment. Like if you were a competitor, how would you gain market share if you couldn't advertise? What's your strategy? Yeah, it's hard. I don't know. Like, yeah. No idea. And and, and your pack, like they're, they're, you cannot have anything on your uh, actual product that's like an advertisement. If you get what I mean, you have to put the warning label that basically says this causes cancer. Yeah, that'd be pretty rough. Let's go through some of the competitive advantages. I want. Why don't we just... Why don't you just hit on all the, I guess, positives about the cigarette business, and then we can go from there in terms of maybe the investment case. Yeah. So cigarette business, for anyone that follows this space, this is well known. But if you're kind of new to this, I think this is quite a good lesson on the counterintuitiveness of the industry. So I think nicotine businesses generally have competitive advantages. This is not just kind of the smokable cigarettes. Uh, first, nicotine is addictive. You know, it keeps consumers coming back and buying more. Uh, second, it's not a gigantic purchase. It's a habitual purchase. So you're going to be coming back and you're going to, re even if it's not addicted, addictive, you're going to have that reinforcement with a specific form or a specific brand, right? That's why Marlboro, with their Marlboro Man advertisement, they did so well, kind of, uh, you know, half a century ago. And then they got frozen. And they've been able to maintain that because everyone has the consistent feel. It's a recurring thing. It's just a habit. And you also have the specific taste and feel of a certain product that another company is going to have an extremely hard time replicating. The biggest example here would be Coca-Cola. And that leads to massive brand loyalty within your category. Uh, for my seat, in the nicotine space, Marlboro has the best brand. It clearly does because of the market share, I would, I would think. And over the decades, it built up fine share with consumers, with the Marlboro Man advertisement, stuff like that, everything they did. They didn't have that ranch down in Montana that I think they're selling now, which is probably good. Uh, I don't think you can underestimate the constant reinforcement of a quality product to, well, I'll say frankly, an addicted customer base. Now, from personal perspective, yes, the cigarette, back in the day, the cigarette companies were shady, but we're looking at them as an investment from today. I'm trying to... For any listeners, I know some people get upset about this, but that's how we're looking at it. We're not talking morals. We're talking investing. Okay. Then government re regulation further widened the moat for Marlboro and these other ones because it, as we talked about, you're banned from advertising. So this froze the market and there's been minimal market share changes within the last 30 to 40 years because, okay, who the hell is trying to build a cigarette brand these days? How would you even do it if you if you came up with a new product and the business is in terminal decline? So, okay, it's going to go away eventually. Why would we even why do we even do this? Um, I think it can shows up in the pricing power. I'll have a chart here, but actually I'll share it after Ryan. Any other thoughts about the competitive advantages here? No, it's certainly a it's certainly an advantaged business, and you can see why margins have been able to get so high for the the winning cigarette brands. I, I think Marlboro, I don't know if you gave the number, but my guess here is that they probably had around 60% operating margins. Uh, and a lot of that is the fact that people can't compete with you. Uh, and so th there's typically in an industry where if you're earning tons of like really, really attractive returns on the, on whatever your business is, 
people will come after it because it's 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 really attractive and you just simply can't hear and so that allows you to really push the price per pack considerably and ultimately margins brett is showing a chart here of marlboro's price per pack each year it's increase per year each year which- yeah yeah it's increased per year so yeah it's they give the wow. data on this i tried to i try to they hide this in the annual reports because they probably don't want to show the world and just in a presentation hey we keep raising prices by this much so a bunch of stuff gets written in the news so for context here and for any listeners i can just explain it easily the average price of a pack of marlboros is about eight bucks today or actually i should say when i looked online it's the average price for a pack of cigarettes is about eight dollars marlboro i guess might be a little bit higher i'm kind of thinking what i've seen in the state of washington where we live maybe it's about nine ten bucks either way about you know decent reference here and that's for today but if we go back for the last 10 years ish i think this is 10 maybe nine you know in 2014 they started raising prices by about 15 cents 2015 about 15 cents a year but then when we started getting in 2019 they're at about 25 cents for the price raise for that year but then they started accelerating this through 2023 now we'll maybe talk about reasons why they did this uh because it might be a bit more defensive than playing offense but in 2023, so far, they've raised prices by over 60 cents. And their market share within cigarettes, and I think they consider it the premium segment, has been fairly stable over the last few decades, which I think is a good testament to why this is such a unique industry and why it is impossible to compete or not so impossible, is, within cigarettes. This is interesting. Do you think it's kind of like a chicken or the egg problem. Do you think management's Marlboro's management team is reacting to volume declines by increasing the price by more and more each year? Or are the volume declines a byproduct of the price increases? And maybe it's both. Oh yeah, I got that for the next section. So or another section. So I say we table that. Maybe listeners can think about that as well. Uh yeah. So let's go to the next one, tobacco volume declines in the United States. I think in order to value the stock, you really need to look at tobacco volume declines and make a bet, prediction, however you want to talk about it, about the rate of volume declines, what they will be in the future. I think we can get some context here by looking at year over year Marlboro volume declines. And this is kind of just unit volume. So it has nothing to do with price. It's just the units getting sold, I believe, to distributors, retailers, wherever. I'll try to share the chart here. But the key is things have changed over the last couple of years so let me try to just zoom in here oh describe it for the listeners if we're i have a chart going back from 2008 so about post gfc if we look at 2009 uh which is kind of the you know bottom of the recession yeah for premium cigarettes i think a lot of people traded down they didn't do too well but which we kind of got out of that and we kind of got out of the post gfc stuff and the economy started to grow again we started to see about 4%, give or take, maybe some years kind of grew. So maybe average it out to about three and a half. I actually didn't do it here, but three and a half, four percent 4%. But, and if you exclude the pandemic here, we're in 2020, uh, you know, volumes actually grew, which kind of shows how stressed out people were that year. Starting in about 2017, which is when the nicotine pouches, the tobacco-free nicotine pouches and vaping really took hold across the United States. We've seen an acceleration in the rate of volume declines going from about 5% uh, to around 8% to 2022 and the last, or excuse me, first nine months of 2023 are well over 8%. I believe the last quarter was 10%. So stuff's moving in the wrong direction. And that's probably why the stock's down. When you saw this chart, Ryan, because I know you got to look at the notes before we recorded, what were your thoughts here? Does it kind of you know, your your narrative in your head meet kind of what the data was showing? Because I think it's, we've talked about this before. It's uh, it's something to be concerned about. Yeah, I think uh, I would be, this is the only thing probably keeping me out of Altria is the fact that we've gone from 3% roughly annual volume declines to almost six, really 8% in the last couple of years, even more so. It's hard to see how that's sustainable. It's obviously, you know, and and you could say, well, oh, they've raised, they can raise prices. It's like, well, then the concern becomes if you're losing volume to 8% a year and you have to then raise prices by 9% or whatever to offset it, 
you're gouging that many more people out of your product, even though it's addictive when there's more and more alternatives. So yeah, I think this is very concerning. I don't think it's sustainable. What there, I, I, I think I saw this tweet at one point, like what the year's 2050 and there's one smoker left in a $25 billion pack of cigarettes. I just don't see how that's, I don't see where you go from here. Yeah. It feels like at some point they're going to have to kind of temper or, or taper the vault, the price increases. I don't know if that'll be enough. What would you do if your management, would you just keep raising prices into oblivion? Like, yeah, I think they can raise, I mean, okay. Uh, I'll just go through what my notes are. What, kind of my uh let me just make sure we're at the right spot here what i'm estimating is a seven and a half percent for smokables now black and mild kind of helps even that out so marlboro will be a little bit worse than that most likely um and i think you know some people might out there might argue that yeah this is just going to normalize because we're seeing a normalization from covid and it's a bit of a bullwhip they're seeing a bit of a headwind here but i don't think you're being honest with yourself if you're saying that vaping and nicotine pouches have a huge impact on this. And it's a big, the key reason why it's declining at an ever increasing rate. I don't think betting on getting back to 4% volume declines is really that smart. But I will say, Ryan, you're concerned about the decrease. Now we have, I have a chart that I'll include in the newsletter of Marlboro volumes going back to 2008. 2008, we're about 141.5. That's billion, I don't know, some sort of unit. Let's just say 141.5 billion units, whatever it is. It might be packs, it might be stick equivalent, so specific cigarettes. Today, uh, we're at, or excuse me, 2022, we're at about 75. So approximately cut in half. If they get cut in half again, what is that? 75 divided by two, 37 and a half, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 37 and a half uh, billion. Then they get cut in half again. We would be at, okay, can I do this in my head? Oh, that's a little tough one there. Something 0.25. We're at 35 divided by two is 17.5 plus. 18.75. The- 18.75. Yeah. I mean, Here's- could they do that over the next 15 years? Could it go down to 18.75 billion, whatever these units are? And prices could go up by 4x over 15 to 20 years. I don't think that's crazy, I got to say. Because what is it going to kind of cost? 30 bucks? I, I don't think that's, I, I don't think it's crazy. That would be, no, no, no. It would have to be way, way more, right? Well, it's for every, same thing. every same thing halving, every halving or every, time you cut the volume by 50%, you have to double. So it would go from 10 to 20 on a price per pack, 20 to, then 40. 20 to 40. And then if you're saying you got to. Yeah. So this is over the next 15 about $80. years. Well, that's, I mean, if we're going to go 30 years in the future, I think that's a bit hard to predict, but you know, I think 50, it, my concern is that it could get worse from here. Like, yeah, no, maybe yeah, I'm yeah. just like mm-hmm. a city kid that just like doesn't, have experience in middle America, real world where the cigarettes live, but sorry, not the cigarettes live, but maybe where consumption is a little more mainstream, but it's not your, your customers that are dying off on the later end, the older people, they're not being replenished by younger folks as much anymore. And with all the alternatives, it, it feels like I would not be surprised if this continued to get worse because I think you could get people that are existing smokers to actually switch off, switch to things More, like ICOs. Yeah. You mean an accelerating? Down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll get to that in the risk section. That's the other thing I, I guess we didn't talk about is if ICOs does well, that's not only like, oh, good for Philip Morris. That it's like a double hurt to all shit because they lost the opportunity to win in that market, but it's also stealing probably share from Marlboro. Oh yeah. Well, Hey, you're spoiling the future sections, but that is a great point. Listeners should, if you're considering an investment in Ultra group, you should definitely look at Philip Morris international because they are encroaching on the United States market. Now the name doesn't really imply anymore as they've really embraced the risk, uh, risk reduced product space. 
I think what I'm trying to illustrate and argue from that chart, though, is that it is not unreasonable that 7.5% volume declines could equate to stable revenues. Yeah, I think it'd be tough. Because you could have said that you could, the price of a pack of cigarettes, like not too long ago, was two bucks. So here's the difficulty for me is that it's like, if you are raising the, so that we've seen the price per pack increase, they've had to increase the price by more than previous years to offset. Yeah. Part, partly inflation, part, partly inflation, but yes, a lot, yeah, a lot with volume reacting I mean, to, I think, the volume declines. And last year, you could have said, oh, wow, 8% volume declines. That's, you know, hopefully that's COVID a, one, hopefully yeah, that's a one-off year. COVID comp, but they yeah. had to raise a bunch of prices more so than they ever have in order to offset that. And then they got the same result in 2020. What was that, 2022? Basically, they got two consecutive years of 8% volume declines. Uh, excuse me, 2022 was the first year of, and then 20, 2023 so far, just to be clear. So I, I I worry that if they are having to raise prices just to keep revenue flat, you're getting, like, maybe it's reasonable, maybe it's possible, but it's much more difficult. And I think they risk much faster volume declines. I don't really know what they could do about it, but... Well, profit. I want to be betting be on like flat revenue <laughs> would be my guess. I think we're seeing it right now as revenue declines seems like a very real possibility. Yeah, I'll run. I'll run through some math here and see what you think. See, uh, see if you have any uh, concerns with the math. Whether you think it's too bullish. But let's go through another section. We talk smokables and black and milds in there, but I don't think it's any crazy relevant. Now, the next section I have is will non smokables create any value? I want to be clear to start. I do not assign any value to vaping. We're just saying, okay, maybe it'll lose value. I'm just going to basically assuming the $3 billion, boom, no value. It's gone. Could work. It could work. I mean, Enjoy has decent customer base. You know, that, that's being very pessimistic, but I think it's fair to be pessimistic. Um, I'm going to assign no value to this Japanese tobacco thing, whatever could show up. And then uh, the investments show up in the enterprise value. So we're going to use enterprise value, knock everything out. What matters here is going to be the smokeless segment, which is oral tobacco, another name for the oral tobacco. And this can get split up between traditional tobacco and new age products. I think it's clear if we look at traditional oral tobacco business or Altria's, it is getting crushed in the United States by the healthier tobacco-free nicotine pouches, or excuse me, yeah, they're traditional, right? I said traditional. So Copenhagen Skull, which have tobacco, are getting crushed by the tobacco-free nicotine pouches that you may have seen. Uh, Zin, number one brand on Velo, et cetera. And this is why Altria's market share in this category has consistently started to climb. I think there's no secret here. And I think this should continue over the next five years. However, how I think obviously they'll balance this is with raising prices on the Copenhagen and Skoll stuff. That's going to continue. And they're going to, I mean, if their market share would like, Zinn has, for any reference here, 75% market share. And I think it would be shocking if it got significantly higher because they're already so dominant. I mean, that's usually within these categories, the leader has about 40, 50% within a CPG category. So it's been I just tremendous. Know. It'd be like Google. <laughs> I mean, I guess those points, they have a good little advantage here versus the competitors. But, you know, they're going to see volume declines here. Let me see if I can get back on trap. And I think it's possible, you know, revenue starts to decline in this segment, despite these price hikes for the traditional products, because as we're seeing, the nicotine pouches are gaining a ton of market share. And I wouldn't be surprised if operating income is pretty damn stagnant over the next couple of years or even down because they're going to have lower margins at the start for the nicotine pouches. Um, and I should have a reference here that this segment generated about $1.6 billion in income for operating, or excuse me in operating income for Altria last year. And it's not nearly as important as smokables, but still important. You know, what would you cap, right? That's, that's a decent amount of the value here. Um, their, their volumes have been fairly stable. But if you look at the underlying trajectory of the industry, on is a very small portion of these oral tobacco volumes. So if the industry flips, 
from majority traditional to majority pouches the new age tobacco free products. There's a world where Altria's market share, as it has, continues to go down and their volume starts to decline. So I wouldn't assign much value to this segment. Any thoughts there, Ryan? Does that make sense to you? No, I agree. They don't seem very well positioned in the oral tobacco space, plain, plain and simple. Like they have two really great like chewing tobacco brands, but chewing tobacco as a category is seeing difficulty and it's largely being replaced by modern oral, the the nicotine pouches of the world. So even though it's a small percentage of the overall overall oral tobacco space, I think it's going to keep eating away at it. And they don't really have the winning horse in that category. Yeah. I, I know it's been so hard for to get stuff approved in this category. And that's why Zen has maintained its dominance because it's just been like something's up with the FDA. There's, I mean, I guess it's not surprising with a government body. It, they're just not approving stuff. And they're so, so slow approving new products. I don't understand why they're not using the Copenhagen brand here. Like Copenhagen, you know how it's like Diet Coke versus, right? Like, why, why are you not using this brand? It's such a good brand. Do you think that transition would, would be possible? Do you think getting... Oh, yeah. yeah do you think yeah. the on customers are Copenhagen customers converted or just a new new age type of customer? There's some data on this that it's like half and half. Um I don't know if there's any good, there's some data out there. And I know that they have some product approved. It's like a SNUS product, so it still has tobacco, I believe, but it's like the enclosed pouch, so it's not getting in uh, your gums. I should say that they are behind in this. I don't think, like, things could get better over the next five years, but I wouldn't bet on it. Yeah. Let's close this out because we've said a lot of pessimistic things about the business. And you've been a little more optimistic. And by optimistic, I say, I, I mean that you said revenue well, could possibly be due. flat. <laughs> the stock of the, yeah, the earnings are, but, we'll get to the earnings multiple here. Yeah. With all that said, it's a 9.2% dividend yield right now. Do you think this dividend sustainable? Putting the numbers together, is this something that's ownable for you? Yeah. And I should say we're skipping management. And uh, before I get into that, I should say that with this business, I have no expectations for management. I have expectations for them to burn a billion dollars in value each year. And I really have them as placeholders because they have not proven anything with this culture. The culture has been bad from a capital allocation perspective outside dividends and repurchases. So I don't even care about what these what they say. Like they, I just read the conference call and they talked about the they had talked up for 10 paragraphs about the growth of on and the and the vaping potential. And I'm just like, guys, like, <laughs> and then they the first vaping question was is a crapshoot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It, it's, it, unless that is what it is, unless it, it could change, but that's what we're going to assume until we get proven wrong. Um, they did complain a lot about the elf bars, essentially, with the flavored stuff, the disposables, but it's almost like can you guys not? You spend so much in lobbying each year. Can you not figure this out and get that banned? Like they technically are illegal, but uh, uh, use your power to whatever. It's a whole for thing. For context, the just first... to put some context behind there. Basically, there's regulation that doesn't allow for a lot of these disposables to be sold, but the regulation yeah. is cotton not being candy enforced. flavor. And yeah, yeah, exactly. And by disposables, I'm talking about the vapes that you see pretty much every young person kind of using or at least that's in in my life and by young person I'm talking generally like 20 year olds and and tw between 20 and 30 they don't own those brands they well i guess enjoy could maybe be considered one but i don't think it is they don't own those brands so they're losing out to them but the regulation isn't being enforced and I, as i think the philip moore ceo called it he said unenforced regulation is just as bad as no regulation at all and that seems to be the case yeah. right now I think that was in the last conference call. Yeah. And then another thing is the first analyst asks, hey, are the Mar the most important question uh, for everyone is pretty clear is are Marlboro, like, what do you think about this volume decline right there basically saying? And they're like, oh, you know, it's, it's obviously getting worse. Like, what do you think? And then management goes, basically doesn't answer the question. So uh, like, look, I, I, like, 
one of the key things for us in looking at a stock is trusting management. Since I have little trust in this management, I want a significant discount when buying this stock because obviously at the right price, anything's a buy. We are so like, okay. meticulous about management, but after a 9% yeah. dividend yield, we close our eyes. <laughs> it, as uh, we were talking about the late Charlie Munger, and I was watching the thing where he was like, look, if something gets cheap enough and it's big, we might buy it. Are we correct to do that? I don't know, but it will probably work. At the right price, something like this works. I think the key here is there's a difference between thinking a management team is shady versus in, like just not that great. Because if a management team is shady, that's when we go, no matter how cheap something looks, we're not going to touch it. But you know, they, they could have some ham, ham sandwich stuff here. Okay, back to your question. Uh, the dividend stuff. I'm going to try to go through the math. <laughs> there's not too many variables, but you know, with this, the most value here is the yields approaching 10%. I guess it's kind of gotten closer to 9% because the stock's gone up. But the most important value here is going to be from the dividend. Altria can provide solid returns if you think the dividend can remain stable over the next five years. I mean, you'll get about half of your money back, you know, before taxes. Uh, and I want to make clear here as a note, I would only buy Altria Group in a tax advantaged account like a Roth IRA and not reinvest dividends. I think it's interesting to evaluate it as a very high yield bond like equity and then use the dividend tax free to be clear to fund other investments from businesses I think have higher quality. I think it's the right way to go about it here. So I'm going to go through my assumptions, Ryan, and I have a Google Sheets uh, that I'll try to put at least the relevant data into the newsletter. One, 7.5% volume declines uh, counteracted with price increases to keep revenue stable from smokables, and this is for the next five years. Two, Smokeless segment sees stable revenue, but declining margins due to lower margins on the on business. And then uh, operating income grows by 2% per year due to the consistent margin expansion at smokables on stable revenue. Uh, for $1.3 billion each year spent on interest expenses. I increased it slightly because of the higher interest rate risk. Could be a lot lower. We don't really know. I think I want to be a little conservative. Uh, put in a 20% corporate tax rate. Who knows? They could have got a lot. I got the jewel asset that's written down. Could be a lot lower. I'm putting 20%. Want to be conservative. Uh, la uh, two more. $1 billion spent on share repurchases each year. Net of stock-based compensation. That's kind of in a pace they're at. They went a little higher sometimes, but also a little lower. And then lastly, $1 billion handicap each year for dumb management decisions. So trying to X that out. Because historically, let's be fair, we should do that. And then the rest gets paid out on a dividend. Before I go into what this means, anything here look wildly off to you? No, I've already kind of expressed some of my concerns about seven and a half percent. Maybe you can make the case the operating income can still grow, but I think it's no. It can, I mean, let's go through the math. Right, it can grow. Because smokeable's margins can easily hit something like 70% under a scenario where prices are going up by 7.5% a year. Because they'll be doing 7.5% less volume each year, but no decline in sales. So Yes, but 7.5% volume declines is an improvement when they're having well, to raise prices by more than they ever have. So just I'm saying it's blended, blended with black and mild, but you know, the, the cigar business. It's just... Okay. Yes, it's the operating income growth is achievable. At yeah, you know, I, I understand the math makes sense, but I think the seven and a half percent is even being a little optimistic. Well, okay, yeah, I think I think it's kind of you know that's it's an important kind of the, question. I, that's the uncertainty for me. Yeah, I also think there's an uncertainty where there, it's not unrealistic. It goes back to six percent. I don't think that's unrealistic. Maybe the eight percent declines, sure. right? Like I think yeah. it's. I would bet that it's going to look significantly worse next ten years than it did over the last time. But yeah, it could still be you know five percent, six percent declines as opposed to the three to four percent that you were seeing between twenty ten and twenty fifteen. Yeah, yeah, 
Okay. So all those assumptions I laid out, which again, uh, this part's a lot of math. So go to the newsletter. I'll try to keep it less numbers-esque for the uh, just the show here. Now, this is an illustrative assumption because I kind of ran through this for the last 12 months, putting all that stuff I have in there. There would only be $3.51 per share in dividend payout capacity from their cash flow. But its actual payout was $3.80. So I think it kind of shows that I'm trying to just kind of even discount what they're doing today. Now, like a lot of this can come from, you know, some of the payout can come from cash on the balance sheet, divestitures, but it's supposed to be a conservative assumption because I want to know what I can still maybe earn over the next five years as an investor if things go poorly as they kind of are. However, even with high interest rate expense, 20% tax rate, billion dollar buyback, billion dollar handicap for management each year, which I guess the buyback is not a negative, the dividend per share capacity will still grow to $4.96 in year five. So from year one to year five, the stock would have a cumulative dividend per share payout capacity of $20. For a stock price slightly above $40, I don't think that's a bad deal. To me, this is, as we talked about, a pessimistic scenario, but Ryan might argue you got to be a little more pessimistic here. You get half your cash back, again, not reinvested. I don't think that's a... It's not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> so what price would I buy it at? I'm not exactly sure. Um, I'll try to run through the math maybe of what it would look like. But I think at like at $40, I was like, yeah, I could definitely see myself when I got there. I think earlier this year, I was like, wow, this kind of looks right in my buy window. But I know for a fact, if we kind of go down another level to 35, I would be crushing the buy button. So I think in between 35 and 40, is what I would be looking at to implement this, depending on what the other opportunities uh, I see out there. Yeah. Yeah, it just, it it makes sense. In in a tax-free account to collect the dividends, I think you're about to talk about this, or maybe you already mentioned it, collect the dividends, reinvest them elsewhere. I can get behind it, but I just worried that your your scenario isn't the most pessimistic that it could be and that if things were worse you basically i mean it's, it's not going to be a zero but you're probably getting less than treasury returns so i don't know part of me thinks like just buy treasuries but yeah, or, so like if you go, okay if you're going to buy an equity and we're not doing this for the fund anymore right there's no even though we try to avoid short-term orientation, there really isn't any any need for it, right? It, like all all we care about is our own personal portfolios for the long run. Why not yeah. take something where you might get a lumpier fifteen or twenty over the next ten years? Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I'm not buying it today at this price. I just think it's a good. I don't know if I call it ballast, but it, it, like at the to, right price, the returns here are pretty hard to screw up. To put your own words into this, why would you own this over Amex at 14 times earnings? E, well, I would say at, at this price, I, I like Amex better, but at $38, like I try, I tried to run the math and you would be at a 13% dividend yield at the current share price in year five. And I think people should consider like, oh, well, I'm going to have it back. But remember, in year five, the stock could be down like a lot, like a, a significant, significant amount, which would destroy some value for you, right? It could be down by more than the 50% that gets taken out. So the that's where could you could down. lose. Yeah, but I, th- yeah, I, would be, no, I-, I think it would be hard. Over yeah. in the in the next in the next five years, even if like the concerns Brian has, there's very they're they're real. Like we shouldn't disclude them. But even if they have this this falling declines that are very very aggressive, over the next five years, they should still be able to do quite well, raising prices. And I don't think the dividend will go down because they've done fifty years of increases, and that's their most important thing. I think you got to use that to your maybe know how because maybe they should invest a little bit more into the buyback at the cheap enough price, which means the per share dividend can grow a little bit more aggressively, but yeah. All right. I think we've gone for basically an hour. Your final ruling here is that you want to own it today, but 
but it's $35. close. $35. All right. But we're, we got to put a title on this that gets people to listen. So we're going to say, <laughs> yeah, we'll Brett figure out pitches something. Altria for a later date or something like. We'll, we'll figure out something. I know right. you got to do a little bit of a tease, a little bit of tease title. Um, yeah, but let's go through the risk. The two big risks, I think, to sum things up. One, rise of risk-reduced products that Altria doesn't own. It would be great if Altria could have a similar thing to Philip Morris International in the, in the European market and some of these other places. If they could drive Marlboro users to quit while raising pri- profits and then bring them over to their own RRPs and nicotine pouches and vaping. However, you know, British American Tobacco is leading with legal vaping in the United States with, uh, what the hell is it? V- Vus? V- I can't ever pronounce it. And then Philip Morris is dominating, uh, excuse me, Philip Morris International is dominating with Zinn, the nicotine pouch brand. So Altria's had decent success, you know, with nicotine pouches, but it's much smaller than Zinn. Enjoy could have some success, but I have no idea. What if ICO starts getting momentum once PMI, uh, Philip Morris International, gives it a full marketing push over the next couple of years? I mean, Altria is not out of the RRP race, but it is well behind. Management has a goal of hitting $5 billion in sales uh, by 2025 for these categories for the smoke-free business. I I don't know if that includes vaping, but honestly, who knows? Which you probably leave maybe $2.5 billion in operating income, uh, given the margin profiles of some of these things. You know, they're quite attractive. (sighs) You know, how much value is left there if that's, that's it, if that's it? Like, it's not going to be it in five years, but if the path is to it, maybe people will price that in. Second uh, risk I'm worried about is more Altria management dumb decisions. You know, it's no secret. They can't get out of their own way. Um, They would do much better. I mean, they haven't been able to get out of their way for the last 50 years, but it hasn't mattered because the businesses are so good. If they stay dif- disciplined with the dividend and repurchasing stock, like if we got back that $5 billion from management dumb decisions in my estimates here and they repurchase stock, well, things would look a lot more attractive. But, you know, the jewel acquisition, $12.8 billion in wasted money, plus the extra debt it laid on the balance sheet with interest expenses, uh, time value of money, it could have been used for else elsewhere. You know, what's the net present value of that? Uh, about a, a lot, a lot, Swedish match. quite a bit of money. What? Cut about Swedish match. The here's yeah, yeah, my question sure. to you, Brett, and I think this is the one we should end on. Is it worth the headache? Is it worth? Well, I, I don't know if it's that big of a headache because you just if you don't reinvest the dividends, I don't know if it's that big of a headache. Yeah, don't make this fifty percent of your portfolio. What I'm saying, like, like why don't you just rather own something where the business is not in terminal decline? Like we 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 can pick from anything. Like we what. Why do we pick the one where it's like, yeah, maybe we can get enough juice out of this, but every quarter that we open up that press release, we better hope it doesn't say worse than 10% volume declines. Yeah. I mean, if you can tell me a business that's guaranteed to grow, I will put money into it. There's risk with every business. Yeah, but there's, there's businesses that have a lot more benefiting factors a lot more tailwinds yeah oh for sure yeah it's at the end of the day it's better to invest in the industry tailwind versus industry headwind but yeah i don't know i just i just don't think it's worth the headache for me but i can see listen if you're just collecting the cash i'm saying why not just own bonds why not find a bond well because you can own a 10 percent bond because you can own a 10 percent bond I know you could you could find probably a ten per, like an actual ten percent yielding bond that's like similar. Yeah, risk. Well, I don't know. I have to have the capital to do that. <laughs> but, I guess that's true. I just looked at Altria's uh, bonds, five point six percent, which I find funny. The uh, yeah, hey, not a bad gig, not a bad gig. Um, yeah, they have some twenty sixty ones out there. That's someone that's not too worried <laughs> about <laughs> the. The business going away. Yeah, maybe. Hey, hey, if we're listening, I would love if uh, to know why this is too pessimistic. Um, to anyone, let us know. I'd love to know why. Uh, I would love to hear a convincing argument for that. But that kind of ends things. Ryan, anything you don't have to have anything, anything top of mind for when we do this? Uh, I think the next one would probably be at the 
in 20, starting in 2024. Anything at top of mind for you? No. No, I don't have a stock in mind yet. Uh, unfortunately, in the time that our savings have been in limbo, we've had like a record month. So that's quite frustrating. <laughs> yeah, would have been a good year. Would have been a good year for aside us. From that, okay. Aside from that, uh, maybe I'll find something here in the next month. We're doing luxury though. Next week, if you're listening right now, next week, we're going to have a not so deep dive on, is it LVMH first? I have no clue. I have no clue. We'll get on checked. It. We'll get it's on luxury it. yeah. month. Yeah, we're doing LVMH, Ferrari, Hermes, and we have a luxury overview with two guests on an interview. So watch out for that. All right, let's hit the disclosure. We are not financial advisors. Anything we say on the show is not formal advice or recommendation. Ryan and I may hold securities discussed in this podcast. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. 